Hello everyone, this is Radu Gabriel Christia. I'm a PhD candidate in economics here at the University of Cambridge. And I'm joined by Professor Marcus Brunemeyer, who is the Edward S. Sanford Professor of Economics at Princeton University. Marcus has been conducting research at the intersection of macroeconomics and finance with substantive contributions in the field of uh, international financial markets, monetary economics, and looking deeply into issues of bubbles, liquidity, and many, many others. He is also director uh, at the Bent, uh, Bentheim Center for Finance in Princeton and with many other affiliations at um, international financial organizations and central banks. Marcus has also coined interesting concepts such as the reversal rate, liquidity spirals, but also paradox of prudence, just to, uh, to mention a few. And these, these are just to, uh, to highlight that um, we have him delivering the Honorary Keynes Lecture at the University of Cambridge here on the 10th of May. So this should give you, um, you know, incentives to join us for a very interesting discussion on international, international financial markets, the international monetary system, and safe assets. So, Marcus, without further ado, welcome, and it's a great pleasure to, to have you here um, uh, for this teaser interview. And I would like to start with a first question asking you, what are safe assets and why do you basically call them good friends. How are their importance essentially evolving in the last uh, couples of, couple of years for the uh, international financial system? Thanks a lot, uh, Radu Gabriel, for inviting me and to be part of this uh, teaser interview and also to invite me to Cambridge to give this lecture, the Keynes lecture uh, this Friday. So what's a safe asset? A safe asset, as you indicated already, is like a good friend. It's around when you need it. It's valuable, it's liquid when you need it. And so we all face idiosyncratic shocks now, or something might go wrong and we need funds, and then you can actually liquidate it very easily, and then you can, use, you can use it. So in general equilibrium, it helps us to insure each other, even though we might not have direct insurance contracts. And that's you know insurance against idiosyncratic shocks. But even more, a safe asset is something which appreciates in bad times. So when the world becomes more risky, it, gets, it becomes more valuable. So it's a good insurance against idiosyncratic risk, and it's also good insurance against aggregate risk. And that's what I call a safe asset uh, in a sense. And you, it has to be liquid, so it can't be too informationally sensitive in a sense. So it can't be attached with a lot of trading costs. So you have to be easily be able to sell it. So the ease of trading is very important as well. Empirically, we've observed that some of the assets that we perceive as safe, they trade at a premium. So here I'm thinking about U.S. treasuries or Japanese government bonds, are they really overvalued or is there like a different asset pricing approach that we should take into account when thinking about those safe assets? I mean, they're overvalued if you only take the cash flow into account. So if the traditional asset pricing is a discounted cash flow, but they provide other services, what we call service flows. And as I said, you know, they help you to insure yourself against some idiosyncratic risk or even aggregate risks. So they give you some additional benefits, additional service flows. And if you price these assets in terms of cash flows, present value of cash flows plus present value of service flows, then they're not overvalued. But if you only take the cash flows into account, then they will be overvalued in a sense. So of all things, I would say they're fairly priced because they provide other services besides the cash flow. Are these features of hedging and liquidity that, that you mentioned and this kind of good friends uh, analogy under certain financial regulation conditions that you detail in your paper, are these features really granting the exorbitant privilege for issuers of safe assets that essentially you're saying that this allows them to run negative primary balances, uh, they can issue more debt in times of uh, recession. Is this view really kind of validating modern monetary theory that we've seen in the last couple of years um, gaining more prominence in the in the literature, but also in the public debate, if you will? If you think of safe assets providing a lot of service flows, and hence the issuer of the safe asset doesn't have to pay so much in cash flows, you know, because you're happy to hold this asset, even though the cash flow you get from the assets is, is very low. It might be even negative, because you get some other service flows out of that. If you are the entity which can issue these safe assets, you have an exorbitant privilege in a sense that you know you don't have to much pay much cash flows because the holder of the asset gets a service flow already out of that. And that means the interest rate you have to pay is much lower. And typically the interest rate can be lower than the growth rate of the economy. And when the interest rate, the real interest rate R is smaller than the 
growth rate of the economy, G, uh, then it's often the case that you can have some bubble formation and you can even issue some bubbly assets or can run some Ponzi schemes to some extent. So in this sense, you might say, oh, it sounds like MMT, but it's, you know, you can only do it to a very limited amount. So you can run some of these assets, you can issue new bonds, but by issuing new bonds, you dilute the existing bonds and people anticipate that. So it's not an MMT theory in a sense. Um, it's all, but it highlights that if you have this privilege or this exorbitant privilege to issue an asset which pays very low cash flows, it's a privilege and it might even allow you to run to some extent some Ponzi scheme. And that's what that whole, the whole feature here, I call this exorbitant privilege. And this, you know, then the question is, how is this exorbitant privilege distributed across the world? Who has this right to issue this exorbitant privilege? And, you know, that might be the US with the US Treasury, as we said, the Jap Japan with the Japanese bonds, or Germany with the German bonds and so forth. But of course, often this right is also hard, hard earned in a sense that you have to have certain fiscal capacity in the background. You have to have a very liquid market with your own government bonds has to function well and all that. So all of this is, you know, often hard earned credentials in order to build up this exorbitant privilege. Thank you, uh, Marcus. And here I'm, uh, I'm drawing two, two lessons for, uh, for now. Um, so basically, Ponzi schemes cannot be run forever. We can't really do that at infinitum. It's, it's impossible to run um, negative primary, uh, primary balances um, and, um, and continue borrowing. But this works up to a point. So there's basically this idea of a, of a debt laffer curve beyond which it's no longer optimal to, to issue that sort of debt without backing in terms of uh, fiscal policy, right? So is there, is there this idea that there's some sort of virtuous cycle here? Because in, in, the, uh, in the literature, we often think about these self-fulfilling debt crises that we've seen materializing in the past with the sovereign debt crisis, for example. But here you're basically saying it's an opposite mechanism, right? So this belief, these beliefs of investors that the asset is safe are basically allowing um, um, the issuer to preserve this exorbitant privilege. But then this is basically telling us that we have debt sustainability analyses playing a vital role in preserving that uh, exorbitant privilege um, status. Is that, is that the correct interpretation here? And how would you comment on these? Yeah, so, so you put it correctly. So you cannot expand your Ponzi scheme at infinitum in terms of size. Of course, over time, it runs forever in a sense. So the size is limited because you mentioned through the debt laffer curve. And the way to view it, how you would generate more revenue is to issue new bonds. But by issuing new bonds, like printing new bonds or printing new money, you create inflation. And... When there is a higher degree of inflation, people think, oh, you know, the real return on holding the bonds is going down. So no, people don't want to hold this bond anymore. It's a little bit like the regular Laffer curve where I think, okay, by creating inflation, I impose an inflation tax on bond holdings. But that means I don't want, people don't want to hold these bonds anymore. So the tax base is shrinking. So while you increase the tax rate, the tax base is shrinking. And that actually creates a step laffer curve. And that's, you know, very different from the MMT theory in a sense that you can do this at infinitum. Uh, you can actually not scale it up. You can scale it up a little bit and it's an exorbitant privilege, but only to a certain degree. Otherwise people, you get too much inflation and then actually it's uh, not beneficial to you uh, anymore. Now, the second thing is what you alluded to in technical terms is uh, that there are multiple equilibria. Now, there's this equilibrium that the safe asset status or this exorbitant privilege it, and can be a bubble. And this bubble is associated with a particular government bond, but it could also be associated with another government bond. And it's an equilibrium selection uh, phenomenon. So if you, it could be associated with the US Treasury, it could be associated with the British pound, uh, government bonds, but it can also jump. So you can lose the safe asset status. And so that's the question, you know, how can you ensure that the safe asset status stays with your government bonds? And for this, you need some extra fiscal space and fiscal capacity. If you probably were to jump to another asset or would be first thing, you can prop it up with fundamental primary surpluses. You can raise taxes. So if you have a political system where there's not too much polarization, if you have 
an economy where the fiscal space is there to raise taxes. So like in the US, you can impose suddenly some higher uh, value added tax. Uh, and then you can actually say, oh, if something were to burst on this bubble, I can just prop it up with fundamentals. And then it's more credible, and then it can sustain the bubble. If you have no fiscal capacity in, in excess, then it's much harder if there's an attack on your same asset status that you can sustain it in this sense. But overall, it is true because it's multiple equilibrium. A safe asset is safe because it's perceived, as long as it's perceived to be safe. Um, that's essentially what I call the safe asset pathology. It does need to be, and it's a hard earned thing to make the equilibrium go to one where your asset, your government bond has the safe asset status. Thank you very much, Marcus, for, for this preview. I think it's a fascinating teaser. And uh, if you all want to learn more about how to mine the bubble, join us on Friday when uh, Marcus Brunemeyer will deliver this uh, honorary Keynes lecture here at the University of Cambridge uh, on the international monetary system and safe assets. Thank you and uh, looking forward to see you all.